and then it finally happens. The stock absolutely rips and all of a sudden I'm up $50,000. Welcome back. A bit of a less formal video today. I wanted to talk about the evolution of the way that I have approached risk because I think it's something that every investor tends to struggle with and take some time coming to terms with and understanding it from their own perspective. I wanted to draw upon my own experience because at the end of the day, my experience is probably very similar to the experience of many others. The growth of a money manager, whether they be a passive investor or make more active decisions, not just in terms of their assets, but more importantly, their psychology, I think follows out in a very predictable way. And if you've been in the markets for some time, if you have your plan in place, whether you're passive or active in your approach, I'm sure you're aware just how important developing your psychology is. Once you've covered the basics, psychology is basically everything. And unfortunately, that's something you can't really teach, right? I think people need first-hand experience to truly get that. But at the very least, I hope that sharing my experience today helps you draw parallels to your own journey and help you understand that it's a struggle I think almost everyone has to deal with on the markets. So I just want to rewind to nearly a decade ago when I was first hopping into the markets. Like many others starting out, it begins with speculation. You have a friend that you bounce an idea or two off of, or perhaps you see a stock pick advertisement or stumble across a stock message board online, and all of a sudden, not knowing any better, probably completely defenseless against thinking critically of what you see and hear, you're on the verge of your very first stock investment, based on some wild thesis that so-and-so should mean the stock price of said company goes higher. And that's pretty much how I started out. I can't remember exactly who pushed who at the time, but myself and a great friend of mine, all of my friends, so many Steve I see over here, somehow got the brilliant idea of throwing some money at the most overhyped, financially unhealthy, managerial lifestyle company of a penny tech stock on the ASX. Well, I hope it goes without saying, we both lost all of our money over the following several years until it finally went bankrupt. Looking back with what I know now, it's almost comical to me that I threw money at this stock in the first place. It was at the peak of its new cycle, announcing some handshake type partnership with Intel, already having about 30 x in price before I decided to buy. Everyone was talking about this stock on a heinous stock website that I would suggest people avoid like the plague. And in fact, I don't think I could have timed the top any better, because I distinctly remember absolutely never being in profit on that position. So that was my very first experience coming to terms with risk. Starting out, risk might just be some faraway concept that you really don't think about or even consider. You may place it in the back of your mind because after all, what's the risk when this stock is about to go to the moon? The only risk is not buying enough shares now while they're cheap. And I wish this part of the story ends here, but it doesn't. Probably for the entire first year, this idea of risk was really nothing more than a foundational concept to me. Just buy stocks that should go up, make money, who cares about risk? And I think more or less I repeated this cycle into a handful or so of the most horribly managed, overvalued, overhyped, most financially distraught companies on the ASX. Looking back now, it's profound just how often I would have never heard of these companies before. Then all of a sudden, there's a most like post on this message board giving the most glowing, positive and extremely biased view of this company's prospects to which I would add shares or add to my existing position. I now recognize this as textbook FOMO. And I remember thinking, looking at all this money bleeding from my portfolio daily, how could I be this unlucky? I think I really only had one big winner back in the day, which did soften the blow, but we're talking maybe one out of 20 trades here. Now my strategy, if you could call it that at all, was just chasing the winner after it's already had a meteoric rise in price and became popular, buying at the top, capitulating sometime later, and repeating this process again and again. Essentially, this is all the workings of someone with zero discipline or psychological awareness when it comes to the markets, and frankly, no understanding of risk. Amateur stuff, really. Now, I wanna bring us to the second step in this evolution. For me, this happened about 18 to 24 months along my journey. For context, I'm studying full-time, I'm also working between 50 to 70 hours a week for absolute peanuts. And I think the worst part of that for me is I shifted so much time, so much attention and energy towards this minimum wage job, neglecting friends, family, my studies and hobbies, and it was for one reason, to earn the paycheck to get my portfolio back up to break even. So I'm working like a dog week after week, all just to break even on my positions. And guess what makes it even worse? 
I took out a substantial credit card at something like 20% interest to speculate on the market. So now I'm bleeding money, earning just enough from my job to break even, and now I'm speculating using other people's money and paying exorbitant fees in the process. All I can really say is that may have been the lowest point for me as an investor and even as an adult so far, but thankfully I was in a very privileged position. I was still living at home and didn't make losses that would cripple me financially. So really I'm one of the lucky ones because had that behavior not been corrected, I can easily see how I and others would spiral out of control doing that. Okay, so that was a bit of a tangent, sorry. So we're about 12 months in, substantial debt for somebody my age, basically bleeding money on the portfolio and earning just enough money from my job to break even, and then it finally happens. Five minutes before I show up to work one day, the market opens, and in classic Luke fashion, I had almost my entire portfolio riding on some fintech startup and they announced a major partnership with a tier one bank. The stock absolutely rips, I'm on the train, jumping for joy, shouting at my phone, go you good thing, and all of a sudden I'm up $50,000. I couldn't save that in two years at this job. Only that's not at all what happened. If you've been paying attention, you know that I'm only buying after the big news, if you can call this big news at all. So essentially the CEO, who was an ex-banking executive, had a pal over at National Australia Bank and they made a bit of a handshake type deal in order to pump up the stock. So in actual fact, I had bought after this big news. So here we are a few minutes before work, a few months later after I bought in after this big announcement and we're finding out that this big Australian bank is actually cutting ties with this beloved penny stock of mine. The stock craters, I think maybe 30% on the open up to 50% during the day. That day feels almost like a traumatized, repressed memory to me now. I panic sold, of course, and I remember on that day, a customer came in and was chatting to me and she was saying, why do you look so down today? And in my classic monotone voice, I look at her and say, in the space of 10 minutes, I lost a year's worth of my wage. So when all was said and done, that first stock that I bought with my pal and the second stock that I put nearly everything I had into in the space of about 12 to 18 months accounted for, brace yourself, $38,000 in losses. And I think this particular day or soon thereafter, I began at least considering the idea of risk. Had I considered the downside risk when it came to these investments, I might have very well behaved differently and that may have led to better outcomes financially. It was around this time that I got a lot more serious when it came to investing. I must have purchased every book on the topic from the local bookstore. I even remember going to my friend, the same friend actually, friends of mine go bankrupt and borrowing his university textbooks on accounting just to gain a better understanding of business and the market. And I suppose this experience of devastating losses coupled with lessons from the greats like Benjamin Graham and Warren Buffett led me down a path of more diligent investing, at least more diligent than blindly following the crowd anyway. So it took time, but I think those first significant losses were the beginning of my understanding of this whole faraway concept known as risk tolerance. I mean, how many people just starting out, if they think about risk at all, not like I did, actually consider the idea of what they would do if their investment turned sour? Well, I suppose that this firsthand experience and actually committing to learning the art taught me that maybe, just maybe, penny stocks aren't really my thing because all I do is buy high into the hype, then sell low after unbearable losses. The volatility is just too much for me and it's clearly unsustainable. So moving forward through a period of about two to three years, that process was refined in three pivotal ways. The first was that I wasn't necessarily changing these shocking habits, they definitely were still present. I definitely still fall for FOMO a few times after that stage, but most importantly, the frequency of this went down by a lot. And I have a notable example for you, and it's okay, you're allowed to laugh at my pain. And we're going to look at Get Swift Limited, announcing so-called partnerships almost daily, and the icing on the cake being a master services agreement with none other than Amazon. But oh bother, it was a fraud. And I lost about 70% on that one while the director got off scot-free. At least I got some beer money back after the six-year class action. Yes, I'm still a little bit salty about that one. But I've only talked about the losers thus far, and to be fair, there weren't really that many winners, none that I would FOMO into anyway. So I want to be clear, that transition from this short-term FOMO mentality took years to become recognizable, and is still an ongoing process to this day. And the second pivot to this stage would be that I committed a lot less cash to these endeavors. 
Yes, less cash, less reward if you're correct, but most importantly, less loss if you turn out to be incorrect. And you can see the actual trend of this occurring from year to year. I was building wealth from my income during this time, so having more capital to trade with, yet there is a consistent trend of declining portfolio turnover year on year. And like I said, this transition is a process that overlaps from cutting out things that are too risky for me, that's financially unhealthy penny stocks, short-term trades, companies I know nothing about, and replacing them with something better. So the third pivot to this would be to find what that something better is. Well, first of all, there was no point in holding high interest credit card debt, so I cut that out as soon as I could. And on the stock side of things, this involved finding investments with volatility that I am tolerant of and finding businesses that I can understand through a process of proper due diligence, evaluation, and more of a long-term value-oriented mindset like the one Buffett would preach. In this stage, while it definitely reduced portfolio bleed, I came to realize that for the mountain of work you're doing in finding these investments, you're holding them for years up to decades with no guarantee of financial success at the end of it. By its very nature, you won't know if you're successful for some time into the future. And it was always in the back of my mind, this idea of active versus passive investing. This idea that you're expending all of these resources in your life just for the chance, not the guarantee, of a few points of alpha every year. And at this point in the journey, maybe six to seven years in, I find myself at a new level of rationalization. Luke, you're not special. You can't beat the market. All the science is there. It's 1,000 to 1 odds. Something needs to change. So after an investing hiatus where I cashed everything out to purchase a property and pay down the mortgage a bit, I more or less became a fully passive investor with the occasional satellite position in various sectors or companies. And this is where I think the real growth begins cultivating. Rewind to stage one. I'm foolish. Stocks only go up until they don't. Take on massive debt and risk it all on one or two companies or go broke trying. And fast forward to today. I don't want to be the person who went through all of this turmoil, progressed this far, only to lose his house on a stock market bet. So risk became a core pillar. It became foundational to my operation. Opportunities come and go all the time, but there's no need to take the risk until it makes sense for you. To give you an idea of what I'm talking about here, and I'm not just talking about investing, really that's just a piece of a larger puzzle in everyone's life. But to give you an example, let's say I might be losing my job soon or interest rates might be going up. Well, maybe I'll hold a little bit more cash in the offset account. Tenants moving out, maybe I'll delay my next investment by a few weeks. We've got a 40% stock market crash in six weeks. Risk is probably worth the reward, let's buy more. And I think that training this behavior comes through repetition and of course constantly learning more about the subject. But what has worked for me and what may be lesser known is not just training your mind when you're in front of the market or managing your finances, but in everyday life as well. Run that little bit extra. Push an extra rep out, eat at home instead of getting takeout, take your coffee to work instead of buying it. Efforts of that nature that consciously and intentionally position yourself right on the edge of being uncomfortable with however you're living your life. This lands us in a state of mind when it comes to investing where you know the market will present you opportunities, some less common than others, some very rare like the COVID crash. But most importantly, there's always the next trade and you need not take this risk until it works in your favor. And this process, these stages, which I couldn't necessarily skip, has worked in a way where all the tools and resources I should have had at the beginning to be successful have progressively cultivated in a way that now it's about incrementally adjusting my risk upwards as my psychology grows to become comfortable with that risk. For example, I personally wouldn't have ever thought of investing in the US or emerging markets. While the growing body of evidence shows that this has incrementally higher risk than Australian markets, I'm already exposed to the Australian economy with my property and job. If I'm comfortable with the volatility of these other markets, there's a case to be made to get more exposure to them. And fittingly, I arrived more or less where I started, performing many of the short-term trading activities that I came to despise for many years. However, now I am able to approach this operation with a solid foundation of understanding for my tolerance for risk and deploying various methods to swing the risk in my favor. And really, I'm not talking about reinventing the wheel here. I'm talking about simple yet very effective things like diversification, cutting losses short, having cash available on the sidelines, projecting the worst case scenario before entering a position, using hedging tools and arbitrage, avoiding stock forums, 
and only committing a small amount of capital to these active operations. Because at the end of the day, I have stuffed this up before and it would be naive to think that there's no risk that I won't stuff this up again. Finally, and probably most importantly, is to have patience. Patience which some people are blessed to have intrinsically as part of their nature and others like myself need to constantly work on. So I hope you appreciate how vulnerable I'm being by showing my skeletons in this video. Please consider subscribing to the channel if you're interested in seeing the rest of my journey. I hope this video helped you draw parallels to your own position and I'd love to hear how you have matured in your journey on the markets in the comments below. As always, thank you for watching and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.